Good to meet you. I'm Tristan. Um, I work with AlphaPoint, the director of product for government and payment applications. And I want to open up with an interesting anecdote. 143 and a half centimeters, four feet, eight and a half inches, seems to have nothing to do with anything, and at the same time impacts the infrastructure of all of our lives today. What is this number? Well, it's actually the standardized gauge, the width of a railroad track. It was primarily standardized in the US, uh, but where did this come from? It's a random number. What does this width have to do with anything? Where did it come from? It has set the standard for even the spaceships that go out of this Earth are actually limited and defined partially by the width of the pieces that can go on the trains, go through the tunnels, be transported around the country to go up to space. So where did this come from? The, the original engineers in the US, they used engineers from the UK because railroad tracks originated, really, or were developed in, in uh, England. And so the same engineers from England came to the US and they said, we're gonna use this standard because we know it, we're familiar with it, we'll just keep it going. Well, where did they get it? Before the rails in England were the trolley cars in England. And the trolley cars in England were 143 and a half centimeters on average. And so the same engineers that worked on the trolley cars worked on the trains, and the same engineers that worked on the trolley cars originated by creating carts. And so there's a standard that's used, that has been used from the carts of old England. They use the same tooling from the carts to the trolleys. And where did that come from? We should ask and keep asking why. Why is that number defining the size of the spacecraft today? Well, Going back to the Roman times from 47, the year 47, not 1847, not 1547, 47. Romans came to England and they had standardized chariots. The Roman chariots was a standardized width. They were the first to standardize this internationally. They funded the infrastructure building the roads in England and that became the standard for the grooves because if, if either trolley or cart makers made anything outside of that, they would risk, you know, uh, destroying the wheels of their cart. So this became the standard. And isn't it interesting to think about the impact of the Romans in the year 47, by measuring the width of two horses, they influence the size and type of materials, type of objects we put in our spacecraft today. Well, I think, in many ways, we are the Romans. We are creating new rails, new standards globally that will be used for hundreds of years, ideally. But we're not making rails for coal. We're making rails for the transfer of value. We're making a new standard that can be used globally for access to financial instruments, financial access for the entire world. Bitcoin was built or was introduced on the heels of the 2008 banking crisis when you know people like me and people like you we went to the bank and the bank frankly said you know i know you gave me money but i'm sorry i don't have it anymore and that's ideally not the situation anybody would be in so bitcoin was introduced and it proposed two fundamental shifts to what is conceived of value and financial access up until that day. One, it is decentralized in that when I give my money to a bank, I depend on them. I also take advantage of all the, con the conveniences that they provide, right? There are many great services that banks provide, and there are some potential risks. This is a, uh, a Bitcoin offers a way that I can have a decentralized store of value. The second part is that it is digital because, I mean, before 2009, we have gold, right? Gold's been around for a long time, but it has its limitations. I need to transport it. I could keep it myself in my, in my home. I could give it to somebody else to custody, much like Bitcoin. However, Bitcoin combines these two elements of digital and decentralized. Fiat currencies, I really effectively 
need somebody to tell me that I can transact in this currency. If I want to use uh, krona or euros or dollars or pounds, I am influenced or I am effectively accepted by that government to use their currency. Unlike gold, I can take gold with me anywhere, but gold has its physical limitations and so Bitcoin merges these two benefits of different types of assets. So fundamentally, what we are seeing is a new type of virtual asset. That's what Bitcoin is on a global geopolitical scale as a new standard. And I have a graph up here. I want to I wanna hear from the audience who knows what this graph is. It's a price chart. Anybody, guesses, yell it out. What? Hash rate? No. Try, any, give me one more, a guess. What? S log? Ah, uh, equity, equities. Um, no, I thought this was going to look like Bitcoin. Obviously, you guys are Bitcoiners, so you know the chart a little bit better. This is the price of gold. Funny thing is, a lot of commentary uh, criticizes the fluctuation of the price of Bitcoin, which is valid, right? Bitcoin is all of 14 years old. <laughs> gold, obviously, is much older. Gold is an, or an organic asset. It is fundamentally a commodity. It is owned by the entire world. No jurisdiction owns it. No centralized party owns it. No government issues it. It is a common public utility to all of humanity, and it quantifies value. The evolution of that obviously became fiat currencies that we know today. Bitcoin offers, once again, a new virtual commodity, like gold, but merging the benefits of each of them. And so, as this asset, this new commodity, is understood more and more by, let's say, mature parties within the financial institutions, within governments, how is that seen and interacted with what is it? Well, we have an example. We actually have one example. There was a historic date, September 7th, 2021. President Nayib Bukele of El Salvador announced that Bitcoin is legal tender. Bitcoin can be used to pay your taxes, buy gas, buy groceries, pay your utilities. It is fundamentally a legal currency that is required to be accepted for payments by the government and all private services in the country. And what this did was more than just a hoorah for Bitcoiners. What it did is shifted not only or shifted the government perspective of what it means to provide services to its citizens. El Salvador on September, 21, on September 7th, 2021, became the first government to actually create an entirely new type of national infrastructure. Every country invests in roads, schools, and hospitals, and however much as we might criticize government services, they are critical and fundamental to the well-being of citizens. And what Bitcoin in El Salvador does is it gives everybody an opportunity to access financial, global financial services. And so, uh, in partnership with the government, this service, on the same day that the president announced the, uh, the law, he announced an app. The app is called Chivo. In slang, Chivo means cool. Literally, it means goat, and it's the goat. And this tool, now that Bitcoin is legal tender, is what everybody around the country can use to interact with Bitcoin, rece send, receive payments, and critically, interoperate with existing financial services. Because if you know, anything about El Salvador. Historically, El Salvador has been a relatively poor country. On, that, on the day that law was passed, 30%, three, three out of 10 Salvadorans had a bank account. Fundamentally, three out, of tens, three out of 10 Salvadorans had access to financial services. From that day forward, and in the term from that day until now, over 70%, seven out of 10 Salvadorans have downloaded the Chivo wallet or downloaded some Bitcoin wallet and can interact with financial services. From 30% to 70% in a year and a half. That is something, that's an accomplishment that financial services and traditional banking has not been able to accomplish for decades. We provide infrastructure to allow that type of access to the entire country. Ideally, this concept can be duplicated in more countries that will fundamentally support a new type of public utility, 
a new type of empowerment to its citizens, where a, government, a governing body, yes, they may have their fiat currency. El Salvador still works with dollars. It works with US dollars. And it works with Bitcoin. And so people that can't afford banking services or are not part of the existing banking ecosystem have an in or an out with Bitcoin. If I don't want to pay for financial services, I don't want to keep my money at a bank, by all means, do what you want to do, access this public financial utility as you please. And that is the ecosystem we drive, that we power. Uh, there are some famous articles came out you know, uh, referencing the adoption of Bitcoin in El Salvador. We've seen increasingly over time, people use the system because it becomes more reliable, more understandable. Again, Bitcoin is all of 14 years old. It is in its nascency in the global scale. El Salvador is a, a year and a half old <laughs> with, uh, with Bitcoin. It is in its nascency. Even yet, we have seen tremendous uptick in utility and usability of Bitcoin throughout the country. And I want to tell you a story. This is Jorge. Uh, we're in San Salvador, the capital of El Salvador, and there is a beautiful uh, organization called Mi Primer Bitcoin, my first Bitcoin, and they run educational programs for kids all throughout El Salvador. So they have a certification, uh, a certification event after going through a course, understanding fundamentally what money is, which, by the way, is a new concept in public education or in education in general for youth. So Jorge understands the role of fiat currencies as it relates to a government. He understands the role of Bitcoin as it relates to a public financial utility. We did some Bitcoin transactions, seed phrases. Steven Levera flew out as well for the, for the event, if you know him. And every day, you have to be 18 in El Salvador to download a Chivo wallet. Every day, we see kids turn 18, download the Chivo wallet, they go through it, and they now have access to a global financial infrastructure that none of their generations or predecessors have ever had. This fundamental infrastructure is changing the lives of every Salvadoran in a way, again, 30% to 70%, we offer this utility to everyone. This was the uh, kind of certification event. It was a very exciting day. Within the, within the app itself, it's critical to know that it is an integration with fiat currencies and dollars and Bitcoin. It is unique in that way. A national utilization of Bitcoin integrates the two such that people who have bank accounts can use those bank accounts. People who have debit cards and credit cards and enjoy the conveniences of those services, we can use them, as we should. There's a great uh, YouTube channel, Differ El Salvador. They give a little intro and overview of the Chivo wallet. As you can see, there are dollars and Bitcoin. In your transactions, you can send, receive, either one. You can trade in between them. It is, once again, an open financial system. For people that are Bitcoin maxis and they don't want to interact with dollars, no problem. You can send money in and out. You can interoperate with Lightning wallets, with uh, dollars or, or, or on-chain wallets around the world. I have about 20 different wallets on my phone that I've done QA to make sure that we understand all the different QR standards, right? And we use the most basic QR standard in Chivo as well to make sure that it is scannable. And as we develop, new standards come out, new technologies become available. The objective from, uh, from AlphaPoint's side is to progress the integration of Bitcoin with the mental map that money has in everybody's mind today. People had cash up until, two, well, people will continue to have cash. People had only cash up until September 7th of 2021, and now they have an alternative. And that doesn't mean that cash goes away. It means that I have an alternative. And generally, optionality is good, especially when it comes to money and all the risks that fiat currencies associate with. So a little bit about us. We power, again, the ecosystem of the Chivo wallet. We are fundamentally uh, a, an ex a software infrastructure provider for cryptocurrencies. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow is our 10-year anniversary in business. 
And on the, year, on the day of founding, Bitcoin was $108, $108. We've definitely been around the block. <laughs> We've learned a lot of things, uh, developed intricacies, developed compliance uh, requirements in multiple jurisdictions, every region around the world. And that put us in a position to be able to support an ecosystem that banks can trust us to interact with our dollars and not hit you know, OFAC compliance, however that may be interpreted here in a Bitcoin conference. There is OFAC compliance for banks, and banks cannot risk their license by interacting with a risky entity. And what we've been able to do is become trusted on a national scale to integrate with national and international banks within El Salvador, such that, once again, we can have Bitcoin next to dollars interoperate with any card, ATM, with cash, as well as your bank account, and any Bitcoin wallet, any Lightning wallet. That is fundamentally what we do. We provide infrastructure for exchanges, payments. If somebody wants to open an exchange, they would do it with AlphaPoint. In this case, the country of El Salvador <laughs> wanted to do that. And what we're seeing as time goes on is more countries are interested in what this is going to look like. Right? There's one example of El Salvador. I doubt many more uh, political leaders will be as bold as President Nayib Bukele and make a statement, we're going with Bitcoin, we're going to approve this as a, fiat current, or as a, as a legal tender, and here's going to be the program. That was a unique instance. What is incumbent upon us at this point is to take that exemplary uh, structure where Bitcoin is available to everybody, as well as traditional finance, uh, financial tools, and make it available everywhere. Funny enough, the concept is not too far away for really most of the world. This is a picture I took in Colombia, and these are not tourists you know, trying to exchange money for, for their vacation. These are locals hedging their currencies with other currencies. Casas de Cambio uh, uh, exchange places are full all the time. Anywhere outside of fundamentally US and EU region has experienced some understanding that there is more than one currency that I interact with in my life, right? We live in a pretty comfortable environment economically wherein, okay, I know euros or dollars or, or whatever or pounds can be relatively trusted. I have my doubts. If you're here at a Bitcoin conference, you probably have your doubts. But fundamentally, most of our payments still use cards, banking services. They're not necessarily bad things. I would argue that the well-being of the general population of the Earth has improved as an overall with these services. The objective is now to offer an in or out to those services with Bitcoin for the billions of people that don't currently have access to those services, can't currently afford them. So once governments and financial institutions and mature institutions that have access to billions of people accept and acknowledge that Bitcoin can be integrated as an on and off ramp for those billions of people, suddenly it is in their interest to accept Bitcoin. It is in your interest, Mr. Bank, Mr. World Economic Forum, Mr. Swift, to accept incoming traffic and support outgoing traffic with Bitcoin because your network grows, your services that can benefit people can reach more people, that's wonderful. As long as the population of the Earth has its optionality and the general well-being increases. That is the objective here. We see with this example, exchange of currency happens every day. And as time goes on, the maturation of these developments occur with governments and banks and institutions. We see an integrated world, right? All of the fiat currencies, well, most of them, let's say, will most likely continue to exist. In one way or another, they might go up and down, they all fluctuate, right? How's the dollar doing today? How's Bitcoin doing today? How's the euro doing today? How's the shilling doing today? How's Bitcoin doing today? The exchange concept is not far away. It is only getting closer to home. And we are understanding a new paradigm, a new concept of this public financial access utility called Bitcoin. And we're saying, hey, 
this is actually the critical path to the next billion people being part of the global economic system. So we support this integrated world. We support the interchange on and off and throughout the entire economic ecosystem globally from every currency as well as Bitcoin. That is fundamentally why we are here, what we're doing. And uh, we look forward to continuing in this process, continuing down the road, learning uh, all of the things that are required in order to support infrastructure like this. Obviously, compliance is difficult. There is, right now, one company in the world that has figured out how to integrate Bitcoin with fiat currency on a national scale. We want to engage with more institutions, more governments, more banks, teach them that Bitcoin is not only the Silk Road thing that it got news lines back in the year. Bitcoin is access for the next billion people to take advantage of the conveniences of public infrastructure, just like roads and hospitals and schools, to take advantage of the financial infrastructure, even in banks. People can go from Bitcoin to banking, and when they want to, can go from banking to Bitcoin. So for this audience, I would invite conversations of that sort. Uh, I see we have here an ambassador from El Salvador. I'm going to embarrass you a little. <laughs> And we've, we've had tremendous support from around the world, from government bodies, from decentralized bodies, Bitcoin maxis, dollar maxis. If our human objective is to improve the net experience, subjective experience of life for the most amount of people in the world, we obviously see value in Bitcoin. Bitcoin can do part of that. We acknowledge there is value in traditional financial services. I enjoy it, you most likely enjoy it. And if you don't, then we can talk about it, and that's okay. And again, that is part of the optionality of Bitcoin being accessible or not. Optionality is the key, and the objective is to ensure that every government, every institution understands that it can be responsibly integrated. Thank you very much. I'm realizing I have seven minutes left. This is off script, but if, people, if anybody has questions about Alpha Point, uh, global expansion, responsible innovation, integration, feel free, to, feel free to ask. I think we have a mic. Uh, thanks for the talk. Just a small question. It might be semi-related. Um, what could be the reason as to why only 70% of the people in El Salvador have yet adopted an, a wallet? It's a good question. The question to reiterate was why only 70% have adopted the wallet, correct? So there are a few, a few elements of it. One, education is key, right? The, the organization Me Premier Bitcoin, we're doing certifications. Those kids were never exposed to this idea at all. <laughs> a lot of the country is not, you know, connected to financial services and frankly not interested. Chivo and all of Bitcoin is an option. It is optional. I mean, even this the Salvadorans that are there, some of them want to self-custody Bitcoin. That's beautiful. I, I have Moon Wallet. I have a lot of Satoshi on my phone. And they would not be on Ch A person who only wants to self-custody can do so and interact with Chivo when they want. Let's say, I have Bitcoin, I'm a maxi, but I got to pay my rent, and I'm a Salvadoran. I can move my Bitcoin onto Chivo, exchange from Bitcoin to dollars, and then take it off of my bank account if I please, but again, entirely optional. So it, the, the difference between 70 and 100 is optionality, is ideally, wallets will always exist. Competition will always exist. Capitalists enjoy competition, generally, and we should support that. And we do. We integrate with all of the wallets around El Salvador. All right, thanks. Thanks for the talk again. Um, I wanted to know if any other nation states have approached you for developing such an ecosystem for them? Or is it confidential? Uh, it is confidential. <laughs> uh, I will say we are in conversation with other, with, uh, other government and banking uh, institutions, and we are requesting and inviting more of those introductions. Because Alpha Point historically has not been in the, in the game of powering government you know, uh, initiatives. 
We're getting into that world. We've done it successfully once. We're, we happen to be the only one that's done it successfully. And we want more of those introductions to, again, cooperate, interact with these bodies that can do it responsibly. Thank you.